Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at The Lighthouse, released in 2019. Really wish I had my big beard for this one. The Lighthouse is the second film by director Robert Eggers, who in 2015 gave us The Witch, or The Vavitch, an incredible period horror film that gifted the world Black Philip. What's the like? The witch was unnerving, beautiful, and sometimes difficult to understand. The same can all be said of The Lighthouse, too, which adds to the mix a bunch of homoerotica and mermaid masturbation material. It also adds a lot of understated humor. I think it's absolutely hilarious, in a quiet madman sort of way. The Lighthouse follows two dudes stuck on a New England island as they tend a lighthouse in the late 19th century. The entire movie rests on their relationship and acting, so it's a damn good thing Eggers cast Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson to give us all the explosive love-hate one lighthouse could handle. Between the surreal, dreamlike reality they have to navigate, and the once again abstruse dialect, always in an accent and sometimes in lengthy monologues, it is a downright crime that neither man got an Oscar nomination for their salty performances. Although I will say, you might want to watch this thing with captions. It's easy to miss what they're saying without them. If I had to succinctly describe The Lighthouse, I'd say it's a fucking trip. It's in gorgeous black and white, its aspect ratio is nearly a square, both characters are unreliable narrators, and there are multiple layers of themes and interpretations, ranging from the Greek myth of Prometheus, to Freudian psychoanalysis, to the aforementioned homoerotica. Since the kill count isn't the best way to dive into stuff like that, I highly recommend the relevant Dead Meat podcast episode, where I, and especially Chelsea, go into a lot more detail discussing those parts of the film. I'm here now to make jokes while I recap and review, tell you about how it got made, and of course, count up the kills. Let's get to them! The movie begins on a dark and foggy night with some dark and foggy music. Sounds like flame hearts in the sky. Two men approach their home for the next four weeks, an isolated island in New England that sounds like it's about to start a purge. The lighthouse there is run by two-man teams whose shifts last a month. And the two men about to begin their month are Ephraim Winslow, played by Robert Pattinson, and Thomas Wake, that Willem Dafoe. They'll be working and living in these crusty, cramped quarters, which don't offer much in the way of privacy. Yeah, having Wake as your boss might not be a gas, or at least not the good kind, but at least Winslow just found something to help keep him company. A mermaid carved in bone. Mmm, bone boobs. Robert Eggers based this idea of two-man teams working a lighthouse on the Smalls Lighthouse in Wales, which operated that way until a tragedy in 1801 that left one of its wikis, which means lighthouse keeper, so emotionally damaged that his friends were unable to recognize him. Just as with the witch, Eggers was devoted to making the lighthouse accurate to the time period it portrays. To that end, production designer Craig Lathrop, who also worked on The Witch, once again constructed all the film's buildings from scratch. Since the movie was filmed in Cape Fortune, Nova Scotia, Lathrop had to work through an uncomfortable Canadian winter building the Lightkeeper's Cottage as well as the 70-foot lighthouse tower, basing his designs off an actual Lightkeeper's manual from 1881. He even designed his own Fresnel lamp for it, and when they stuck a movie light inside, it shone for 16 miles around. Their first night on the island, Wake tries to make a toast to their coming four weeks together, but Winslow turns the booze down because it's against the rules to drink on the job. Wake counters that the rules are for Winslow to follow his orders, no matter what they are. Yes, sir. Aye, sir. Aye, sir. It's a bumpy start to their partnership, and it's only going to grow more toxic and abusive as time goes on. Wake has Winslow do the dirty work, like shoveling coal, while he tends to the lamp, which stands on rocky shores and keeps the beaches shipwreck-free. I respect that a lot. The manual says that they're supposed to take turns at the light, but Wake has claimed it as his own. He's the only one allowed to get naked up there. To Nakey Wickies! Out on the shore, Winslow sees a bunch of logs floating towards him, which freaks him out plenty even before he he sees a dead body in the water. I'm not gonna count this body now, but I will later when we have a bit more context. Besides, the thing's not even really there. But maybe this mermaid is? 
work. I calm down, fish lady. Winslow wakes up in his bed the next morning, just in time for their shift swap, and wakes morning thunder. <sighs> Winslow's work is long and laborious, though it does win him a fan in the form of a one-eyed seagull. <laughs> Aw, but Winslow don't like the birdie boy. Gotta take your friends where you can find them, dude. It's not like you're gonna get any praise from Wake, who berates his work at every turn. You're too slow. You a dullard? No, sir. Fooled me. I'm not mad, laddie. I'd just be disappointed. Despite the constant admonishments, you can tell Winslow wants Wake's approval, so you feel real good for the guy when he's able to get a legit laugh out of the older Wiki. Curse me if there ain't an old tar spirit somewhere in your land. <laughs> Aw, if this movie wasn't black and white, we'd be seeing Winslow blush right now. Eggers knew he wanted to shoot this in black and white as soon as he wrote the script, and he used a very specific film stock to give the movie its high contrast look. Unlike The Witch, which was lit almost entirely through daylight and candles, the film stock used for The Lighthouse required an enormous amount of light to get proper exposure. It was often so bright on set, the actors couldn't even see each other. The lack of color also meant that costume designer Linda Muir, who did exquisite work in The Witch, had to focus on texture and contrast in the characters' outfits, all while making sure they were authentic to the time period. Even the suspenders we took apart and rebuilt so that they were specific for this. Winslow isn't Wake's first wiki, and he asks what happened to Wake's previous partner from a prior shift. Wake says the one-eyed man died after going insane, babbling about sirens and the lamp's magical powers. He believed that there was some enchantment in the light. Sounds like superstition comes part and parcel with the job, as Wake warns Winslow not to harm his new birdie buddy. Bad luck to kill a seabird. And he like really fucking means it, man. <laughs> Bad luck to kill a seabird. Okay, I won't kill a seabird. God. Though it might be hard not to when the thing keeps pecking at the window, keeping Winslow up at night. God, that was good bird acting. As time goes by, Wake continues to criticize Winslow's job performance and doesn't stand for any back talk. I already said- How dare you contradict me, you dog? He threatens to dock Winslow's wages if he talks back again, so the work must continue, no matter what the weather's like. Halfway through their four-week shift, the two try another attempt at conversation. What wrong such a one as ye? To this dammit rock. Such as what? Pretty as a picture. And compliments. Aw, oh, that was nice. Winslow says that before he became a wiki, he was a lumberjack in the Hudson Bay. Wake thinks it's suspicious, a timber man wanting to be a wiki, and accuses the younger man of being a drifter on the run. Winslow denies the charge and says he's just a dude looking to find a place in this world. And he's definitely not a vampire. During the day, Winslow keeps to his tasks as Wake sleeps so he can tend the lamp at night. That's when Winslow gets some privacy and a little one-on-one -on -one time with his ivory mermaid. But sounds like Wake's having just as good a time with that magical light. Not sure you want to be standing there, Winslow. Because while you used to be a timberman, Wake used to be a seaman. And you don't want to let seamen get too close to you. Whoa, is that a tentacle? Yeah, Wake might have an internet connection up there. Winslow finds that their drinking water is a bit too thick and dark for his tastes, and discovers that the problem is a dead gall in the cistern. It's not his one-eyed friend, though, because that bird's right there, completely healthy and alive. Good things. Yo, dude, no! He was completely healthy and alive! What are you doing, man? What did Wake say about killing seabirds? Bad luck to kill a seabird. It's bad luck. And that bad luck immediately manifests as a sudden change in the wind, signaling an end to this island's brazzle-dazzle days. Good thing these dudes are about to make like a kid graduating from Springfield High and blow this pop stand. It's the last night of their month-long shift, and over a celebratory crab dinner, Wake finally convinces Winslow to join him in drink. To relief. But Wake's not the kind of guy to leave your glass empty for long, so the two knock back a few until they're pounding the table and singing a drunken shanty like they were out sailing the orca. It may be the high point in their topsy-turvy relationship, with a camaraderie cradled in alcohol, masking their tension from the past four weeks. Thought one night you was bound to split me skull and twain, but... You're a good one. They end up drinking a bit too much, though, and waking up late the next morning, deep in a haze of hangover. Aw, and the chamber pots are full? Better empty those out, Winslow. 
Uh, yeah, maybe not into the wind, though. While getting his work done in the rain, Winslow is surprised to find a sexy beached mermaid. Damn, dude, get a load of those boobies. They're not made of bone at all. Though it is hard to ignore the way she'd be screaming at him. <laughs> What's wrong, guy? Don't want a lady who sounds like a smoke detector? In the evening, the two wikis wait for their replacements, but the relief never comes, probably owing to the bad weather. I mean, I get it. I wouldn't want to sail in this either. It's super stormy. Production for The Lighthouse took place during March and April, and for shots like this, they didn't have to fake shit. That weather was all real, baby. So what they're, they're there like this. We were there like this. The entire movie sounds like it was grueling to make, but because Eggers is such a confident visionary, the actors didn't seem to mind. The conditions were terrible. I mean, real physical pain and challenge, but there was so much pleasure in what we were doing, it wasn't a problem. Also, I know he's about to be Batman, but I will forever love that Robert Pattinson spent the late 2010s doing a bunch of weird as fuck indie movies. And about maybe three months after I met him, Robert sent me an email saying, I think I've got something pretty strange, and sent it to me, and I was like, you are correct. <laughs> Stuck doing overtime, Wake tells Winslow some more bad news. The storm has wiped out their provisions. He blames Winslow for failing to ration their food over the weeks that it's been since they missed their boat to leave. Weeks, weeks, I have weeks. We slept in, dead drunk. It's been weeks ago since we missed our Winslow. Though for us, the audience, it seems like it's the same day, Wake accuses Winslow of losing his mind. Is he lying and gaslighting Winslow? Or are we getting faulty information from seeing things through Winslow's eyes? Who knows? The only thing we do know is that the sky is dumping buckets, soaking our little lighthouse lads as they dig up emergency provisions. Yep, just what you need for an emergency. A whole bunch of booze. Alcohol can no longer smooth over the faults between these two. Especially after Winslow catches Wake telling a story about how he got his bad leg that differs from a previous version he had told. Winslow's paranoia and suspicions is mirrored by how we, the audience, don't know which of these characters to trust. Their specific objectives at times are deliberately unclear. This is all amplified by the claustrophobia of their setting, which is itself intensified by the nearly square frame that boxes everything in. Director of photography Jaron Blaschke, who also shot The Witch, was the one who suggested the aspect ratio of 1.19 to 1. He also thought to use a custom camera filter that brought out imperfections in the skin, getting the guys real good and craggly. The only time they didn't use that filter was with the mermaid, which made her look ethereal and beautiful compared to the salty central characters. Wake and Winslow get in each other's faces. What? 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 Before Winslow fantasizes about sticking his meat into some meat. If I, if I had a steak, I would fuck it. He insults Wake's cooking, which greatly offends the old wiki, causing him to plead for a compliment about his crustaceous cuisine. You're fond of me lobster, ain't you? You're fond of me, lobster. Say it. He demands validation, telling Winslow to say the goddamn words. And when Winslow sticks to his guns, Wake erupts with an incredible curse. Hark! Hark! Triton! Hark! This one minute and 40 second monologue comes out of nowhere and is unforgettable in its grandiloquence. Smother this young mouth with punch and slime. Do ye turn blue and bloated with builds and brine and can scream no more. Just like with The Witch, a lot of this movie's old-timey vernacular was taken from contemporary sources. In this case, books from Sarah Orne Jewett, a Mainer author who interviewed old sea captains in the late 19th century who actually spoke with this piratey dialect. Wake ends his diatribe by saying that Winslow's soul is going to become the sea. And that's enough to get the younger Wiki to finally acquiesce. All right, have it your way. I like your cooking. God damn it, this movie's hilarious. As the storm rages on, Winslow sneaks up to the lamp and tries to break inside so he can finally experience its magical powers that he's been kept away from. When that fails, he goes to steal the keys from a snoring Wake, only to change his mind at the last minute and consider a straight up murder. Wake, uh, wakes up and only has one thing to say about that. 
Winslow keeps working at his chores and his liver, getting so sloppy drunk, he looks like he'd be wearing a barrel in an old Disney movie. The alcohol affects his handball sessions too. While trying to picture the mermaid lady he saw on the beach, he instead begins to see the back of a guy's head and the lamp. What's the matter, man? Can't get off to bone boobs anymore? I'm not gonna judge Winslow too much though, cause he's reeling in our first kill, the decapitated one-eyed head of Wake's former wiki. It's probably just a hallucination, but fuck it. We're starved for kills here. Wake and Winslow get even drunker and put their earlier shanty session to shame. I I don't know what the fuck they're saying there, but it gets stuck in my head at least once a week. Makes me want to break out and dance. Yeah, get funky with the wake. Now the sparkle man, go. They exhaust themselves into a drunken slow dance, nearly kiss each other, get into a fisticuffs brawl of no homo, and finally wind up on the floor together, where Winslow makes a confession to wake. It's Thomas. I'm... No, I'm Thomas. I'm Thomas. Winslow says that he's not Winslow, he's Thomas Tommy Howard. As for where the name Winslow came from, well, Wake doesn't want to know. Don't be spilling any of your beans to me. I ain't interested. It wasn't that way at all. But Winslow, which I'm gonna keep calling him, can't help himself. He needs to get it off his chest what happened to the real Ephraim Winslow, who was his logging foreman. Seeing the back of his head one swipe of the card hook will be all. He says he could have killed the belligerent boss, but swears he didn't do it, even though we did see a pole jab in his masturbation montage. He does admit, however, that when the real Winslow fell into the river, he didn't lift a finger to save him. I just stood there as all just... just stood. Watched him get swallowed by them logs. The real Ephraim Winslow was killed, and Tommy Howard here quietly assumed Winslow's identity, just like a regular Dick Whitman. At the conclusion of Winslow's confession, Wake's nowhere to be seen, but his disappointed voice rings through the empty cottage. Watch you spill your beans, Tommy? Watch you spill your beans? Shout out to sound designer Damien Volpe, by the way, whose work, along with composer Mark Corbin, returning from The Witch, makes this movie just as much a sonic delight as it is a visual one. The bean spill in Winslow then hallucinates the dead body of the real Ephraim Winslow, the same one he had seen earlier floating among the logs. Since we've heard the whole story now, I'll go ahead and put him on the count, even though that body's not really there. Don't worry about it, it doesn't matter. What does matter is this amazing shot of Wake looking like a Wiki Cyclops, which was inspired by the 1904 painting Hypnosis by Sasha Schneider Defoe. Huh, Defoe posed like a Defoe. A terrified Winslow runs towards the shore and tries to use a dory to get himself off the island. But Wake comes from behind with an axe and some jealous rage. Don't leave me! He smashes the lifeboat before taking off after Winslow, not letting a little thing like a bad leg keep him from his pursuit. Inside, Winslow accuses Wake of killing his former Wiki, the one-eyed guy whose head he saw in a lobster trap. He's so excited to call Wake out that he starts clapping like Donkey Kong. But Wake tells him he's gone mad. And I knew you was mad when you smashed up that lifeboat just now and chasing me with an axe trying to kill old Tom. Yo, but wasn't that... Hey, just what the hell's going on here, guy? It's real difficult to say what the truth is at this point, as Wake continues to mindfuck Winslow's memories. How long have we been on this rock? Five weeks? Two days? Where are we? Help me to recollect. The Elder Wiki even suggests that he and this lighthouse might just be Winslow's deathbed hallucination. Maybe he's still up in Kennedy, dying from an accident in the logging field. The only response to that kind of suggestion is to drink, but since they're all out of booze, they mix turpentine and honey together for a real chest thump and libation. <laughs> It reduces them to a fit of howling laughter as the storm continues to swell outside, stronger than ever. Guys, do you even care about this storm? Well, I bet you do now. The next morning, after trying to piss in a moving target, Winslow finds Wake's logbook floating by, saying, Hey fella, read me please. Winslow does and discovers that Wake's been betraying him this entire time, writing him up for all sorts of things. Recommend severance without pay? Severance without pay! 
Hey! Winslow has had it and gives his own lengthy scathing monologue. Though compared to Wake's, it's less almighty and more flatulence focused. Stick your laugh at you, snoring in your goddamn farts! Your goddamn Tell him how you really feel, dude. I smell like piss. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah! You smell like jism. <laughs> oh. Like rotten dick. Like, like curdled foreskin. Okay, you know what, I think you've made your point. The two of them get into another fight, this one more choky than the last, and Winslow ends up hallucinating the real Ephraim Winslow, before feeling the tender hands of that mermaid from the beach. Ooh, she into you, dude. Go in for a kiss. <laughs> Well, shit. Winslow's not fond of getting Kiss Me Fat boy, so he beats down the tentacular Thomas Wake until he's spitting up bile. Of course, Wake's not really a squid monster, but that doesn't stop Winslow from reveling in this new power dynamic. He makes Wake bark like a dog, and then, oh my god, leads him out on his hands and knees on a leash and walks him like a dog. As Chelsea once said, this scene is pretty amazing if you picture them as Edward Cullen and the Green Goblin right now. Winslow pushes Wake into the hole that once housed their backup booze, then starts shoveling dirt in to bury Wake alive. Gotta love Defoe delivering another epic monologue, even while getting dirt shoveled onto him, sometimes in his mouth. Peeling. Wake falls silent, and Winslow steals his keys so he can finally see what's up with that mysterious magical lamp. Ain't nothing to stop him now. My life belongs to me! Except Wake with a jump scare that nearly made me shit my pants. Winslow finally puts Wake into a permanent sleep by swinging an axe down into his head just off screen. Now there's a proper kill for us, lad. Thank you. Winslow takes one more swig of lamp fuel, which, come to think of it, might explain a lot here, then crawls up the stairs to see the oh holy light that Wake has so viciously guarded. The hatch seems to open on its own, just for him, and he's finally face to face with the powerful lamp. It opens its lens for him to see inside, and after everything he's done to get here, I really hope he likes it. Um, so is that a yes, or...? His screaming ends when he falls down the hatch and tumbles down the long spiral staircase. With that, I'll count Thomas Howard, alias Ephraim Winslow, as dead, because the film's final shot shows him in a Promethean pose, his exposed bowels being pecked at by a seagull. Curiously, there are logs in the background, suggesting that maybe Wake's theory of this being a deathbed hallucination was true. Or maybe it wasn't. This movie don't care what you think. How many people's lights were snuffed out in this movie? Hark! Hark, Meaties, hark! Clamor! Beseech the Lord Meat King forth from the net, awash noxious in his judgment! Dead pixels and dropped frames blind these young eyes with interminable buffering, choking your bandwidth till ye screens turn blue with unambiguous failure, and ye can watch no more. Only when he, wreathed in 3,000 Kelvin soft light with novelty tea and tight buzzed beard, take up these cursed numbers. His charms wielded like hammers in these blasted bits and crushes ye right in your funny bones, bursting ye guts. Ripped open, bloody and raw, and nothing for ye roommates or parents to discover but the fading light of the dull gray opposable digit, fixed erect, only to be lost in nigh biblical deluge of interaction. Unremembered by any sub, any release day, to any algorithm or any trending page for any part of ye viewer, even any trestle of your profile is viewed no more, but is now itself dead meat! No? All right, have it your way. Let's get to the numbers. With my generous counting system, we had four victims in the lighthouse, all of whom were male because the only lady in this movie was a sexy screaming siren. With a runtime of 109 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 27.25 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Thomas Howard, 
aka Winslow. I'm not well versed in mythology, so I was confused by this ending the first time I saw it, but those gulls eating his innards was memorable to see regardless. Dome Machete for Lamest Kill will go to the real Ephraim Winslow, since it was the least graphically shown of the four deaths I counted. And that's it. The Lighthouse came out in 2019, and honestly, I think movies like this are why we have film in the first place. It's such a unique cinematic experience, and I'm just as grateful as Eggers that it exists. The fact that I got to make a strange black and white movie about two lighthouse keepers farting is incredible, and I feel super privileged. Can't wait for the next thing he does. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Resident Jojo Reference, Grace Lendage, Jorge Labordico, Darth Kalel, Corey Weston, Tanner D, and Anthony Garrett. This is the last Kill Count that I'll be in front of this set for. Next Kill Count you watch on Friday is The Prowler that'll be at my new house. By the time you're watching this, I'll have been living there a couple of weeks, but I'm filming far in advance. That's how it be sometimes. Thanks everyone. Be good people.